Hey, this is all Drake from Evil, and you're watching Richard Metal Fan. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Richard Metal Fan Interviews, episode number 158. And today's guest, we're talking to Old Drake. Old Drake is the guitarist and frontman for the band Evil, a thrash metal band based out of the UK. Today we're going to be talking to him about what got him into metal, pretty much going through the discography of Evil, as well as talk about their new upcoming album, The Unknown, which comes out July 14th under Napalm Records. So, without further ado, let's go talk to Ol. So, what's up, guys? I am here with Ol Drake from the Almighty Evil. How are you doing today, man? I'm not bad. How are you? Not too bad. Not too bad. Bad. Yeah. It's great to be able to talk with you today. So, kind of like the format is, I want to talk about like your musical history and sort of like do a rundown of the Evil discography, as well as I want to talk about the upcoming album. But before we go into that, take me back to young Old Drake. So, kind of growing up in England, what were the first bands that got you into metal? And what made you want to start playing guitar? So, I, I wouldn't even say it was a band that got me into playing metal. It was my brother Matt, the the old singer of Evil. Um, he was listening to, well, mainly Metallica. And, you know, I was a lot younger and I would hear it and think like, what, what's this shit? Like, why, why are the guitars so loud and everything? And over time, it just kind of grew on me and I just got into it that way. So from that, I, I discovered like Testament and Annihilator and just got obsessed with the guitar through those bands. So that's, that was the initial like kick into metal, really. All right. All right. And so were you in any bands before starting up at Eval or is Eval like your first band with you and your brother? I was in a few. I was in one in high school on drums that we didn't have a name and we'd never played a gig. We were playing like no one liked metal in my school. So it was like sublime songs and um, the offspring and stuff. And it was fun. But uh, after that, I was in a, a new metal band on drums uh, called Dwell. And at the same time, started the Metal Militia thing, which became Evil. So, I, yeah. yes, I was, but Evil was my first, like, proper band that we put a lot into. Wow. I never knew you were, like, a drummer at first. I always thought you just played guitar. No, I, I started on drums. I um, My dad had a friend who owned a music shop, and I'd go with him on the weekends. And a guy called Maurizio Mielli, a really good guitarist, and he had a drum set set up, and I was like, fuck. So I just started having a go and loved it. Awesome. And so tell me about like forming Eval because I know y'all formed 2004. It was, so it's 2002 that Eval started. I, I don't know why online it says 04, but we started in 99 as Metal Militia. And then we yeah. did a few years of Metallica covers and then we got bored. Hence the and name. I think 2002, we, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So yeah, O2, we started writing our own stuff. And um, so we were kind of already formed. We were already the band, but how we formed in 99 was it was Matt and Ben already knew each other from school. I was Matt's younger brother, so I obviously knew him. And we literally put one ad in the local guitar shop saying bass player wanted, Metallica, Anthrax, Testament. And Mike called us and he said, oh, that sounds cool. We met with him and it was really good. And that was it. It was really, really simple. We didn't try anyone else. It was Mike and that, that was it. It was great. Awesome. And so I kind of like, like go, going in order, I believe the first, first thing to talk about is the all hollows Eve demo, demo from 2004. Tell me about like that, because I was listening to it in preparation for this interview. It's just very raw sounding and really heavy. Hey, tell me about like making that. Yeah, so that was the collection of our first, was it five songs, maybe, maybe six. Um, I was heavily into Alex Skolnick and Testament at the time, so a lot of the solos and riffs are kind of um, testamenty. Um, and we just did it with a local producer uh, in Huddersfield. Um, didn't cost us a lot, hence it sounds kind of raw. And it was just fun. We, we did not have a goal. We weren't thinking, like, right, let's record this and get signed and like send it to labels. We just thought we were just having fun. So that EP was just fun. Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, I know a couple, couple years down the line in 2006, you did the, 
the hell dem- demo, which I think is a, pretty much a step up from the Hollow's Eve. Eve. Like, I feel like the vocals on there is a lot more polished. And I feel like at, the production wise, it just sounds a lot better. Yeah, I, I think Matt learned a lot from recording the first EP to the the hell demo. Um, he he went through everything that I've recently been going through, where blowing your voice and like learning how to control it and holding back. So it was definitely a big step up. The production was better as well. So um, again, I think this is where we stepped up a bit in thinking like we actually want to do this, you know, try and work towards this being our career. And the hell demo was a bit of a a showcase in a way so we were starting to think like what if someone hears this and like wants to sign us so you know it was, it was a bit more of a on purpose effort all right and so eventually i know you you were playing like around uk K and stuff stuff like trying to hopefully get signed but then of course your first label earache rake found you guys so how did earache find evile we played uh, a festival that you've probably heard of bloodstock in the uk but it was back in 2005 or 2006 and we were playing the unsigned tent. So it's all the bands that just aren't signed and they get to play this great festival. Uh, for some reason we were headlining. There was no reason behind it. And we just were honored to be there. And Eric were there. And I think they were possibly drunk. So it kind of <laughs> played in our favor a bit. So, um, we just got an email on on the Monday after that festival, just saying, "Oh, we were just wondering if you'd be interested in signing to Eric." And we we kind of not that we thought it was a joke, but we were like, "What's like the the catch? Why? What aren't you telling us?" And we we emailed back saying, "Great, thank you. Do you mean to actually sign to the Eric Records, like Morbid Angel Carcass Eric Records?" And they were like, "Yeah." We were like, "Oh, holy shit! Okay, so." it was just mental it all happened at once yeah and then of course 2007 you dropped the debut album enter the grave in my opinion one of the most underrated modern thrash metal debut albums like tell me about like the making of this album like the thought process going into making the debut evil record it was it was kind of mental because like i said it happened all at once but the good thing about the album was all the songs were already written by uh, maybe one maybe two so there wasn't, for lack of a better word, any effort put into that album because the songs were ready. Um, but the recording of it was insane because when we were talking to the label about who should produce it, we joked, we sent an email saying, oh, what about Fleming Rasmussen? Ha ha ha. And they said, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll ask him. And we were like, no, no, no. We were literally joking. But he, he liked the demos and he said, yeah, let's do this. Because we did oh, never wow. expect to... We, you know, it's Fleming Rasmussen. We thought he'll cost like quarter of a million to even email him or something. But um, he was just really into it. And he said, yeah, I'll do it for for your um, budget. And we flew to Denmark, um, recorded through the desk that Puppets and Lightning recorded on and yeah. old Metallica gold discs all down the hall and huge studio with like grand pianos. And for for our first outing, it was very, very weird and daunting um i know all of us felt pressure I, I think we were pretending that we didn't but we really did yeah like like i remember first hearing thrasher i was like whoa it's just like like whole album like the title track thrasher schizophrenia everything about this album is great cool thank you <laughs> yeah i even love like the bonus dvd like apparently like you were trying to like play like your own song on rock band and try to beat their, their the high score and especially like the live footage and oh even, yeah, like, yeah i stuff at this fucking great i am um, we put it on expert mode and it's just too hard on rock band. <laughs> i had to put it on like the next level down from <laughs> difficulty i can't play it on a plastic guitar but i can play it on a real guitar <laughs> And I remember seeing like a video of like oh, wow. Drag- Dragon Force trying to play through the Fire and Flames, and they can't even play it, play their own song on Guitar Hero. Yeah. It's it, it's a different animal. It's just not the same, you know. It's it's quite funny though. Yeah, but then when you put out Enter the the Grave, did you like start like touring outside of the UK for the first time, or was it still just kind of local? So we did some pre Enter the Grave, where we we went to I think Holland and maybe just holland but after that 
is when we we could go out of the the country we got to tour with like exodus and we got the megadeth tour as well through europe and like i said it was all at once and just terrifying but awesome it was very cool all right and then the next album infected nations like usually with the debut album you have like your entire life to write it and there is a lot of hype with the first album when it came to making infected nations did you feel like pressure to follow up enter the grave yeah definitely because not that we weren't prepared but the second one was like right we've got to sit down and write an album knowing that an e- a label is on the other end of the email saying like come on we want to hear some stuff and it was a it was a really steep learning curve of sending a demo and then being like uh what what's this it doesn't sound like grave but like well we're going for more like da 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 um but I think I really like the album. It has a special place for me, but I personally think we, we, if there's a phrase overwrote a lot of the stuff on there. So we, we tried to be a bit clever. We tried to do some weird time signatures and be a bit technical and it's good for what it is. But I, I think we, we might've just pushed, pushed it a bit too far. I still enjoy it, but for me, it was a very, there was a lot of pressure at that time. Definitely. Yeah, especially like love songs like the title track, even Metamorphosis, Metamorphosis, even Devoid of Thought. Yes. Really just great songs. Yeah, we put a lot of time into it, especially Metamorphosis. That that took a long time to write because of it being so stupidly technical. <laughs> All right. All right. And then then you st- I think eventually you toured and I'm not really good with these kind of like awkward moments, but it was, of course, the last album with my Mike. Do you sort of like remember the moment when you found out that he had passed away? Well, because I know he did. He died on tour for this album. Yeah, I, I don't mind, by the way. Um, it, I remember we were in Sweden. We were touring with Amonomath and Entombed and it was just another day. I think Mike was feeling a bit sick. The, the day before uh, we just said you know rest up and Mike was the kind of guy who if he was sick he wouldn't do he wouldn't go to the doctor he'd be like well I'm fine it's okay and um it he it turned out he wasn't and our two manager took him to the hospital and he came back to let us know and um honestly a lot of it is kind of a blur now and I just remember just not feeling nothing but being so numb to it all that I I couldn't process it it took me a while to even process that it happened so yeah it's a very very bizarre time very very sad time yeah and was there like any doubts of like continuing on after that yeah so when it happened we were at the very top of Sweden and we had to drive all the way down Sweden through into Europe, then up over the ferry back into England. I think it was like 16 hour, 18 hour drive. And our tour manager, Lyle, he didn't take any breaks. I know that's probably illegal, but he drove all the way back to get us home. Maybe took two like toilet breaks, fuel breaks, and um, got us back. The the whole way back, there was us, us four, three, Lyle and our merch girl, Lucy, and it was just really quiet and i don't think anyone knew what to say but i i can't remember who said it but someone said out of nowhere out of the silence just shall we carry on are we going to carry on and i think all of us collectively as soon as that was said thought well yeah like why wouldn't we it'd be such a waste and kind of an insult to mike for us to be like oh we're done now so we literally carried on just for mike otherwise we wouldn't yeah yeah if only he would be, be see see what's going on now i think he would be happy that you are are still together and still carrying on yeah i, th- I think he would be i i i'm not an overly religious person but i do believe he is somehow around or knows yeah. in some way yeah but then of course eventually you got a uh, joel in the band how did you end up up hooking up with him because i know you were doing like bass player auditions yeah, we did some auditions. We had a few guys try out. Um, there, there were some cool ones, but um, we we didn't want to get someone that was a not 
the same age as us, B, who wasn't very good because we didn't have the time to teach them songs. And um, our, and C, the main thing we wanted was someone that we could get along with because all four of us got along so well that losing Mike was like, well, we need someone we can have a laugh with and live with, basically. And the other people who tried out, they were they were great bassists, but we didn't feel the um, the connection. So Joel turned up, and before he'd even played anything, we just thought, he's cool. And he knew Mike as well. He used to speak to Mike in the local pubs. And so that was kind of a, a cool connection. And he was just cool. I, I genuinely, at the time, I did not care how good he was on bass. I just got along with him and... And he could play a few of the songs. So it was like, that's, that's great. Let's, let's go. All right. Were you kind of like ner- nervous uh, ha- introducing him into the band? Because anytime when like band member or is like cha- change members or if someone passes and they have to, to, to get a new guy, guy, there's always like wondering like, hmm, hmm, is he, will, will he be, will he be a, a better or just is as good as like the other one? Um, I don't think we, it even crossed our minds. The only thing we thought was, I think history has taught us well in the metal world <laughs> that to treat him with some respect and welcome him and and not haze him for it. So, so yeah, but we didn't, we just went, we just got him and then we went back on tour. All right. All right. And then kind of going into the next album, five serpents teeth. I think it's a great, strong album. Um, I love like, especially songs like in dreams of terror cult and in memoriam, I think it's a step up from infected nation. So what was the thought process going to that? And of course the first album with Joel. Yeah. Um, the, the third album, I think it was the one that we put most work into. I mean, we toured the U S and Canada for five months in 2010. And I took my shitty little laptop and my shitty little line six plug-in thing. It sounded horrible, but I spent a lot of time in the van bouncing around trying to write riffs and stuff. And it, a lot of it was written on the road in America, all these riffs and parts and stuff. And it was, I wanted to, I think, we all wanted to make the album that we didn't make for the second one because we were so stressed and like we're trying to make it cool that we forgot to just go with it. So the third one was kind of our second, our secret second album. And it was just a collection of riffs and things that we all really enjoyed because um, Eva is quite a collaborative thing. It's it's mainly me who ends up structuring everything and, and writing main riffs, but I always give it to everyone else to say, how is this going? Is this good? Is this bad? And people have input and change things. And that album was that. It was, there was a lot of back and forth and it came out really well. Really, really proud of that album. All right. And then the next album, Skull, I thought was a also a pretty good uh, album. And I hard to believe that this year does mark the 10 year anniversary of that album. So how do you feel about that That now 10 year, years later? I, Skull, before, before the last two albums came out, well, the one that's coming up, um, Skull was maybe my favorite Eval album because the, it, it was a struggle to get through that album writing and recording. Um, but what came out, I was really proud of, especially the track tomb. It's kind of like our second ballad. And, um, I, I think it's kind of an, it's an, it's an overlooked album with Eval. I think a, because of maybe the artwork wasn't fully clear, like the logo and stuff. Um, I, I envisioned a different artwork, but um, the other one was went was gone with. Uh, but it's I don't know. It just didn't re- receive the same amount of listeners, I guess. And um, but Eva fans, I think, should check out the Skull album because there's a lot of really good, heavy, fast stuff on there. Uh, but I can't believe it's been ten years already since that album. And I obviously had five years out of the band, but. Um, yeah, wow, ten ten years. Yeah, yeah. Is there, I know we got the new album coming, but is there a chance we can get a celebration somehow? Maybe throw in some deep cuts to the set. Yeah, we're definitely planning it. There's there's one song on the Skull album, 
I think it's the last song on the album. Yeah. So the third and the fourth album, we always want to put in the last songs on those two because they're really, really cool, yeah, thrashy songs Truth, that we lies. never really play live. Yes. Yeah. It's, I think that's one we're going to put in for like the, the diehards. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. But then of course uh, there was like that eight year gap between that. And of course, hell and Le- leashed. And I know there's a part where you sort of left the band after school came out. Now, what was the reason for leaving evil? Um, there were lots of reasons, but the main reason was just since starting evil, it was my full time everything was evil like i'd wake up do evil go to sleep and i've done everything evil and you know jobs i'd have to quit jobs uh, i i didn't really have a normal life and i saw like friends growing up going through all these normal mi- uh, milestones that people do in life and having a job earning money which is <laughs> one concern and it's i wanted to just do the normal things in life i wanted to get a job, start earning some money, because to be honest, it's really hard to do that in a metal band. And I wanted to start a family and just do some normal things. So in my head, I was never coming back to do evil or music ever again. So um, that was the main reason I left. Oh, man. Yeah, I know. I think during during that time away, you also did a band called uh, Rebo. So tell me about like that, because I don't think nobody really talks about Rebo. No, so that actually happened while I was still in Evil. That it wasn't like a thing I left to do. Um, we are sponsored by Jägermeister, and I just got an email saying, "Would you be interested in doing this one song with uh, these people, like the drummer from Skindred and others?" And I said, "Yeah, why not?" And the timing worked out so much that I'd left the band, and then this comes out, and it's like, "Oh, Drake Evil guitarist leaves to start like weird hip hop kind of." dj thing i was like no no i didn't no this was just like an email <laughs> that i got from jägermeister i haven't <laughs> done this wow man so it's just really bad timing on that but it it wasn't it was just one song it wasn't a band it wasn't a, a project it was just some people getting together to have some fun it yeah. was spun kind of differently yeah is there any any chance you'll do some more stuff like that in the future or is it just focus on eval now I think it'll just be eval. If anything, the other thing I might do is some solo stuff, but I've barely got time to do eval these days, so maybe not. Yeah, but then, of course, you also do did a little solo thing, because I know in 2015 you did a thing called Old Rake, which is sort of like a pun yes. on your name. Tell me about like the idea of doing like a solo thing. It's It came from when I'd left the band. Uh, we'd fulfilled our contract with Eric. I emailed the, the label just saying... Just wanted to say thank you for everything you've done for the band. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And they emailed back just saying, would you be interested in releasing a solo album of like guitar shreddy stuff? And I was like, well, I don't really want to be in the music world anymore. I don't want to tour. And they said like, no, no, you don't have to tour. Just let's just do a cool shred album. So I thought, okay, why not? So I got like James Murphy on board from Obituary and Death. He produced it and helped me out a bit with it. Uh, Mike Heller, the drummer from Fear Factory and uh, is it Malignancy. And it was just fun. It was literally my my homage to G- Steve Vai, Joe Satriani um, and that kind of stuff. So it, it was just a fun project to do. That, that's all. I did not have any kind of goal in mind. Yeah. And then, of course, your last album, Hell Unleashed, one of my favorite albums from from 2021 when how was was it like that that like almost like an eight year gap between skull and the skull and this album did you felt like like nervous making a new eval album after all these years i i didn't feel nervous no because i'm so used to the process that it was it was just natural the, the only problem was the the ups and downs with matt in that the five years i'd gone there was no music there was no new albums there was not much touring a lot of people thought eval just didn't exist anymore and a a lot of people still don't don't think we exist anymore but um when i rejoined it was like right it's time to get a new album out it's been too long we have to do it now so i just hit the ground running and started writing riffs i picked some riffs up from like a few solo things i was going to do but never did some older eval stuff that we never visited and 
just got it all done. And then the, the downside was that Matt was just so busy that we waited a whole year until we just got no vocals or lyrics. And it was just the time that it was like, we have to get this done. And then Matt left. So then we just thought, well, what can we do? I mean, we, we didn't want to get a new singer because that's such a dangerous thing in the metal world to, to replace a singer with a new face. So we thought, why don't we get a familiar face and put them on vocals? And I was the only one that fit the, the bill. So I just reluctantly, no, not reluctantly. I, I, I think I was kind of excited to do it. It's just, I didn't know how to do it healthily and well. So like doing the demos for hell demo, I could like taste blood when I was tracking the vocals. I was like, Oh no, what have I done? <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I learned, learned quite a bit. So it was yeah. a, a fun album. We just wanted to like do something extremely fast and brutal to let people know that like, hi, we're still here by the way. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I'd actually had interviewed Ben a couple years ago when hell and leash came out, I'm not asking about like, 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 were you like, like like nervous because now you you being like taking up the lead vocal do duties i just wanted it was curious like how was it like for you you first record with you on vocals like that that experience like it it was difficult at first but because i've been doing backing vocals for so long i kind of also already had the connection between my hands and my voice so a lot of it was easy but um it's just that the technical side of things with the voice and blowing it or not blowing it and singing correctly. Um, that was the challenge because you'd play one show and push it too much and you'd blow it and you literally can't sing the next day. So that's one thing that Melissa Cross really helped me out with. Um, I'm still learning today. I'm still not as good as I want to be. Um, but yeah, it, it was cool. It was a challenge. I like a challenge. So it was cool. Yeah, and I also love how you had like a c comedian Brian Posehn on the song Gord. Or how'd you end up hooking up with him to to do like some backup vocals on there? So it goes back years where someone sent me a picture of Brian on the Sarah Silverman show wearing the Enter the Grave shirt, and I was like, "Holy shit!" Bert from Big Bang likes Evil, so I, was, I got in touch with him. Like, "Hello, I'm I'm, I'm in the band Evil." I just wonder if you want to do anything and he's he's a really busy guy so he couldn't do much so he actually did backing vocals on cult on the third album but it wasn't like made a big deal about i think it's in the liner notes um but when it came to this one it was again just a an email like hey brian do you fancy just doing some backing vocals on this song gore all you have to do is shout gore so he did that and it wasn't meant to be like a featuring brian percy and thing but I think the label saw it as like a, and I don't blame them. They saw it as a thing to feature Brian Posey. And so when the song came out, everyone was like, well, where's Brian Posey? I can't see him in the video where I can't hear him. So yeah, he's just on backing vocal. It's, it's not like we're not going to do a duet or anything. <laughs> yeah. And then of course you also had a new guitarist, uh, Adam Smith, Smith joined, joined with you. And he's been with you guys since, since Helen Leash. So how, how did he end up joining the band? So Adam, we, we kind of knew it of Adam anyway, because he had a band locally called Riptide. Uh, ben, ben was more of a, a friend with Adam than any of we were. So um, he was a fan of Eva. One of his first gigs was Eva when he was like 13 or something. Um, so we, we thought of anyone that we, we could get and no one would fit the bill. And Adam was the only guy that we thought could because again the joel thing like we didn't want to spend loads of time teaching some of the songs getting to know someone and we got on with adam he was a really, really nice guy he is a really nice guy and i just i, I rang him out of the blue and him being a, an eval fan i was like oh hey it's it's all from eval he was like uh hi i was like oh would you fancy playing guitar for eval and he said can i ring you back in 15 minutes because <laughs> he had to like um uh, shit himself a bit and they rang back just saying yeah of course that, that's amazing so yeah. he's a really cool guy really relaxed chilled guys he's, he's a good fit for the band yeah and i also love how you covered uh mortician's zombie apocalypse and honestly this album it does a lot more brutal it's like how some also hints of death metal was that were you like fans also fan of like death metal hence the cover of mortician 
Yeah, definitely. Uh, Mortician have always been one of my favorite death metal bands. Along, I, I like the older death metal, like Obituary, Cannibal Corpse, Deicide kind of stuff. And um, I've always wanted to have an excuse to play that song because I just love that riff. Uh, so that was the time. <clears throat> yeah. And um, yeah, death metal's kind of always been in Evil. I, I think especially on the Skull albums, a lot of death metal in there. Um, I just love the the brutality of it. So yeah, it always finds its way in there. Yeah. And then of course we have the new album, the unknown, which comes out uh, on the 14th of this month. So what was the writing and recording process like for the new album? I think with um, Hell Unleashed being so fast, it was like 85% speed, 15 like chug. Uh, we, We wanted to, do the polar opposite we thought we don't want to do the exact same thing again and just do like thrashy speedy stuff so we thought let's just turn it on its head let's do 15 percent speed and aggression then 85 percent chug and groove so um the main thing that was the catalyst for it was whenever we play like festivals or live we noticed our songs are always either really fast or mid paced. There's nothing ever here or here. And there's all these tempos that we never explored because a lot of my riffs would be a certain feel. So we kind of thought, let's just explore all these different tempos we've done like this. There's no change in what we've done other than changing the tempo in the song. So it's still the same brains, still the same writing process. Um, it just so happened that these different tempos they call for like more melodic vocals because the slower you play, the more vulnerable the vocals are because you you focus on them more as soon as they happen. So it just had to be more melodic because I tried some like shouty stuff, but it just did not work. It was just kind of embarrassing. <laughs> All right. All right. And with this album, did you want to try something different? Friend, or try to continue in the same vein as Helen Leash, or would you wanted to try something completely new and fresh? Yeah, we always try and do the not the unexpected, but we always want to try new things. So, obviously, we're not going to change genres or anything or change style. I think people are saying that we change styles. Like, no, literally, listen to Eva's back catalog. We've done slow, we've done mid, we've done ballads. People forget that we've got two ballads, well, three now, but um, yeah, it's definitely let's whenever we're writing something, we always think like, what, what do you not expect here? So if you get to a section, instead of doing the expected, we always think like, no, let's stop. Let's go somewhere else. And we're always trying to think of different ways to do things. So I definitely wanted to do something different. Yeah. Yeah. Because you guys definitely have evolved, like going from like enter the grave to infected nations to now the unknown. No. And I feel like you always try to like take like a different, like approach to every album. There's not like you, like a thing that evil sticks with. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, we, the whole retro thrash thing, it's great if you like that, but we, we've never really been a retro thrash band. I know people will say like, that's bullshit because we're a thrash band that aren't from the eighties, but we're not like, I think the only song we've got that you could call, like, I hate the phrase, but pizza thrash is thrasher. (laughs) It's a song about thrash metal and banging your head. We don't have any other songs that are about like, yeah, metal, metal's so good. Um, it's, we always try and, you know, create a world in a song instead of just sing about zombies or something. Yeah. Yeah, and I got to say, like, I'm quite familiar with the back catalog stuff. And with this new album, I feel like it's like the most aggressive and heaviest album that you guys have put out to date. What is sort of like the inspiration behind sort of like the aggressive feel to it? I think because when I was writing the music, when we were all writing it, is that the songs that I knew were going to be about a certain thing kind of lended themselves to each other and some of the subjects are unfortunately quite negative and pessimistic. So it just, it lent to the music a bit more to be just a bit, what's the word oppressive and in your face and dark and evil. And again, we always try and make the music sound like the name of the band evil, the evil and vile. 
So the music is always has like an edge of darkness to it and chugginess. So we tuned down a bit as well on this one because we just, the riff just didn't suit a higher tuning. So we tuned down to C sharp and yeah. 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 And I think you've definitely achieved that with the new album. It definitely ha has that kind of that thrashy feel, but at the same time, there's also like the death metal elements. Same thing with the last album in there that sort of like cre creeps in every once in a while on it. Yeah. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah. And also like the, the brutal heavier sort of sound, um, but there are some like the interesting aspects of, of the album with like the ballads and even like the thrashy stuff, even the more brutal stuff. Uh, what, what was sort of like like i guessing with like every so song is there does that sort of like like capture a sort of like an emotion that you feel behind it at the time yeah definitely i th i think um it helped when the lyrics started coming together for each song because i i, I can't explain but it it guides the the writing more that um like at mirror speech it sounds different to the rest of the album because the subject of the song is really different from the other subjects because it's all about, I think it's, it's the most personal one for me because it's about like self-esteem and self-image and body dysmorphia that I grew up with and I think still slightly have, um, that it, it couldn't be the same as the other songs. It had to be a bit off the wall and, um, yeah, I think the emotion behind the songs does guide the songs a bit more. So that's probably helped in some way as well. All right. And when it comes to like making the lyrics, lyrics, do you have to like put yourself into like a certain mind frame to get sort of that kind of like emotion or does it just come naturally and organically? I, it's the same as writing the music for me. So it has to, it has to always have a seed. I always like call it a seed that I kind of fall in love with musically. So if I write a riff, as soon as I feel it, or as soon as I play it, I'll feel that like, that's, that's really good. I need to make something of that. And lyrics are the same. Like you just, what I do is I just sit and write for ages, just writing words, even if it's crap, even if it's just like, I don't know, a stupid example that, the easiest lyrics you can ever think. I just write them out until it, it makes sense in a way. And then I'm like, oh, that could be cool to start that. And then I just kind of start building on that simple crappy idea until I find something like that seed. I'm like, right, I've got something. And then I just forever build on that. The same as with riffs and the, the structures. So it's, it's just a lot of trial and error i'd say trial and error is the main theme of evil <laughs> all right and i and and next question i think what you we kind of touched upon it earlier is of course like singing and playing guitar when it comes to like that especially when you like write new songs do you ever try to like th like practice like figuring like okay okay while i'm singing like i'm trying to know where my hand is per fret like do 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 i'm just curious like what's the thought process into like doing that and to figure out how you can do it live too so i'd like to say i do I'd like to say I do prepare for that, but I often neglect thinking of that. So if a riff does simplify, I'll think, right, here's where the vocals go. But a lot of the time, I think it's my habit from Matt being the singer because I would never worry about what the vocals are going to do. I'd just be like, here are the vocals for the verse. Here's the chorus. So a lot of the time I would write the vocals and lyrics and then record them for the album, like on this album and then not have to worry about playing and singing them until we rehearse. And then when it came to rehearsing on a few songs, I'm like, Oh shit, I shouldn't have done this. <laughs> but it just means I have to like re rehearse it a bit more. Like, so I'm singing nah, 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 when I'm playing. Nah, nah. Okay. So it's just a few rehearsals of like, I can't get that one word there, but eventually it's fine. <laughs> And our, and also love, love your guitar playing from a technical standpoint. It's really impressive. Like, do you also like know like music th theories and like, do you ever know like what key you're playing in and sort of like the scales and all that stuff? Yeah, I am. Um, I spent a lot of time learning music theory, but the main thing that benefited me was learning things by ear. So I kind of don't care about music theory. I know what key I'm in. I know the the minor thirds of roots, blah, 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 blah. But the thing that benefited me was, um, what do you call it? 
uh, interval training. So I can hear two notes and know exactly the distance between those two notes, um, just naturally. And like, if I'm sitting watching TV and a commercial comes on and there's a, me- a melody plays, I'm figuring that out on, on the guitar in my head. So that's the one thing that's benefited me um, theory wise. I know it's like an octave, then it's a minor third, flat second, blah, blah, blah. And even my other half, she's, she watches me as I'm watching something and she says like, you're figuring that out in your head, aren't you? It's like, yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so I, it, in a way it, it's kind of, it's kind of ruined music for me because whenever I, when I hear music, I'm instantly figuring it out on the guitar and I was like, right, I've got it. And I know it. So yeah, it's awesome. good, but it's also a curse. <laughs> awesome. Anyway, I got a couple more questions for you. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind cool. of like, like to coming from like the UK, because the UK is definitely one of the, of course, obviously the birthplace of heavy metal with like Black Sabbath, but all, and also like greats like Iron Maiden, Ju- Judas Priest, Motorhead, but also has some like the heavier bands like, like Carcass, Cancer, Bolt Thrower, Cradle of Felt. So it was like the scene in the UK, was it like really diverse or was it for you trying to like get outside of like England to play in front of like different countries and different audiences and stuff? The UK is strange because when Eval started and we started playing our own stuff, um, most people, if not everyone, would just they would say to us like, "Why are you playing thrash? It's dead. No one plays thrash anymore." This is like two thousand two, two thousand four. Um, it wasn't until like we got signed and like Muni West got got bigger that everyone was like, "Oh, thrash is cool now, yeah." Um, so it got better in the UK. Um, but I feel it's, it's, it's a very niche genre to like in the UK. So it's, um, like our crowd is always hit and miss. Like some people in some areas don't come, some areas are better in the UK for metal, but, um, that's not putting the UK down. It's just like, it's a very hard place to live at the moment as well. There's, there's like cost of living crisis. Everything's got really expensive and people just aren't buying tickets anymore unless you're Metallica or Taylor Swift. So, um, you going into Europe or playing festivals or it's more of the viable option at the moment. So it's hard to say the UK is in a difficult position at the moment. All right. And sort of like the final question I wanted to ask you is talking about like your gear, because I, I wanted curious, like what kind of guitars that you play the strings, pedals, amps, and all that good stuff. Sure. So I play Carillion guitars. They're from the UK, like custom built, really nice guitars. That's fucking awesome. I have two. Yeah, really nice. It's because it's custom built. I could ask him to do specifically everything that I want it to do. (coughs) So it plays amazing. Um, At the moment, we're using Kemper amps. And it's the main reason for the Kempers is because it's just so easy. Like there's no stress. I don't have time. I've got two kids and I work full time. So get the camper, plug it in. It's fine. Even at the show, the, the, the desk at the front, they'd plug direct into the camper and it's an amazing sound out front. It's, it's perfect for me. Um, the strings I use are, hold on. Winspear strings oh. from the UK. Never heard of it's a those guy called Tom before. Winspear. Really cool guy. Pardon? Never heard of those string brand before. No, no, that, they're really cool, really cool guy. Um, he, he does it all himself, this one guy. He does the picks as well. We have our own Eval picks, Winspear. Cool. And other than that, that that's mainly all we use. So we, we, try and, we try and support the, the smaller guys, you know, instead of just going insert brand name here you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's great so uh before we go i just want to thank you for this interview it was great to be able to talk with you today is just anything else with the release of the unknown that you would like to plug and is there a chance you could please bring eval to the states for a tour one day we'd love to have you <laughs> so honestly the last album hell unleashed we tried getting to the states and the cost it's just so expensive for a band like us. We, we were in the red before we even left the country if we were going to do it. So we are always trying. I'd love to play um, Milwaukee Metal Fest and like do some dates around that. And yeah, we're, we're really trying. But all I'd like to say is I hope you like the new stuff. If you do like it, please consider buying a copy of the CD or the vinyl or the digital download. 
it helps bands more than you can imagine buying the physical product and spread the word would awesome. be great awesome thank you for your conversation all is just any final words you want to say to the viewers to close this out um have fun <laughs> that's awesome so everybody old drake from evil we'll see you next time